We are live every Monday. And, you know, I'm always happy to hang out with Rose Hoy. And we have a special guest tonight. But first, I want to introduce myself. This is TMS Roundtable Global. Uh, um, my name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. We are streaming live from Israel. And um, Rose is streaming live from Melbourne, Australia. It's evening for me. You can see my eyelids dropping. It's morning for Rose. And Rose will introduce our one of our favorite guests tonight. Go ahead, Rose. Good morning, Tova. Good morning, world. Thank you, Dr. Dave Clark, for joining us tonight and today and this afternoon in uh, um, America, the West Coast of America. That's right. Oregon, right? Yeah. Oregon? Uh, yes, Portland, Oregon. Uh, there you are. People are not familiar with where that is. We're on top of California. <laughs> love it. Are I you love giving it. California precedence, or or um, or is it their notoriety that you? No, it's just a, you know, just like to point out that we're superior to California. <laughs> Good. Okay. Great. Excellent. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Clark is a gastroenterologist. He's also um, an author, uh, again, about somatic pain and and the results of it and how it comes about. Now, when originally speaking to Dr. Clark, he was saying that he came to this conclusion independently, separately to Dr. Sano and realised that many of his patients were had anxiety and their pain was not fixable by surgery. And... He started searching and he's got a wonderful story that I love to hear. And hopefully he'll tell us again <laughs> about that moment when it clicked for him that there was more to that smooth muscle than just surgery and just fixing, if you know what I mean. The fixing isn't necessarily the fixing of the body. It's the fixing of the heart and the soul. So thank you, Dr. Clark, for coming on. Please, would you mention your book as well and just give us a brief outline of that wonderful moment when you, when you realised how important our emotions are and our feelings are. And, and the result of that has been the, the PPDA and he now speaks to other doctors. So please give us a, a whole picture, if you don't mind, and let our audience hear your story. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rose and Tova, for having me on once again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, interact with you across uh, so many time zones and, and bring this important information to the world. Um, it's the, the, my origin story is a little embarrassing, frankly, on behalf of the medical profession. I mean, I, I thought I was doing well in my medical career. I mean, I had gotten an award for diagnostic excellence in medical school. I got into a top training program after medical school at UCLA. I was passing my uh, national examinations with flying colors. You know, I thought everything was going great. And then after, actually in the eighth year uh, of my formal training, I encountered a patient that I had no idea what to do for. And, and you know, this was like finding out toward the end of getting a PhD in mathematics that there was something called the multiplication tables. Um, you know, you're all of a sudden you're going, wait a minute, how did I get this deep into my education? You know, less than two years away from being released onto an unsuspecting public um, and not know about this woman's condition and the cause of her illness. And uh, she was in her late 30s. Um, she came to us from another university because they couldn't find a darn thing wrong with her. Uh, and, and she was severely afflicted. She, had, uh, she was averaging one bowel movement per month. And she was taking uh, four different laxatives at double the usual doses. And it wasn't working. And she was sent to us because we did a particular specialized test that nobody else did having to do with the electromechanical properties of the bowels. And we were sh 
you know, absolutely certain that that test was going to show a severe problem because there was no other explanation that was possible for this woman's illness. Um, and we were shocked when that test was normal as well, just like all the other ones. And we were at the end of the road. You know, we were, there was nothing more we could do for her. I was, you know, uh, tasked with doing the exit interview and sharing the bad news that she was going to have to live with this condition indefinitely. Uh, and just, you know, out of desperation, I asked her about stress and everybody else had asked her about stress and she didn't have any. She was happily married. She worked half time in a bank. Uh, she had two kids. Um, there was really nothing there. So um, again, in desperation, I said, well, what about stress, you know, any stress earlier than, than right now? And, you know, thinking maybe something traumatic had happened to trigger her illness, which had been going on for two years. And she interpreted my question to mean the remote past. And she says very matter of factly in the same tone of voice you'd use to read a grocery list, well, my father molested me. And I had never heard a patient say that before. Again, I'm, I'm eight years into this. I've interviewed a lot of patients, never heard uh, somebody talk about they're having been sexually abused or frankly, any other kind of abuse uh, from the past. And I didn't know what to do with that information. I didn't think it was relevant, but uh, it was out there and I had to do something with it. So I fell back on, you know, my very earliest training, which was to take, take a history of it, find out, you know, what exactly did this molestation mean? How frequent was it? When did it start? And it turned out to be one of the worst stories of sexual abuse that I heard in my entire career right there on, on day one of this. Uh, her father had intercourse with her an average of once a week for eight years, from age four to age 12. I, I was shocked and I was more shocked that she was telling me this again in this entirely a calm tone of voice, you know, and if you didn't know better, which I certainly didn't, uh, you would think, well, she's processed this trauma. She's moved on. You know, she had, nobody's touched her against her will for 25 years. Uh, this, you know, almost certainly is not connected to this uh, very severe illness that she has today uh, that she's only had for two years. Um, but I thought, well, you know, this is a pretty striking um, piece of history from her. And, uh, it, at the very least, it gives me an opportunity to pass the buck, and I can call this uh, psychiatrist that I know uh, named Harriet Kaplan, who is uh, board certified in internal medicine as well and has uh, a background in mind and body um, interactions. <clears throat> and I thought, you know, at least it gives me something to do for this patient other than just tell her you're a hopeless case. Um, so I, I hooked her up with Dr. Kaplan and thinking, you know, there's nothing going to come of this. I uh, forgot all about her. Uh, and then a couple of months later, I ran in into the elevator. Dr. In the elevator. Yes, there she is, <laughs> Dr. Kaplan. And I'm, you know, we're riding up in the elevator and we know each other. I got to come up with something to make conversation. So I said, whatever happened with this patient that I sent you a few months ago? <clears throat> and she says to me, the patient is cured. I'm not seeing her anymore. She's she's See, fine. It gives me goosebumps every time I, I hear that story. It gives, gives me so goosebumps. Amazing. It just upended my world. You know, I'm, I yeah. had no idea, you know, eight years and nobody's ever said, you can cure serious physical illnesses just by talking to somebody if you know what to look for. Um, and I, I'm getting off the elevator and I turn around and say, Harriet, how in the world did you do that? And I prevailed on Harriet to come visit with us in outpatient GI clinic. And we always found a patient or two that she could weigh in on and give us some education about the basic framework that she would use to uh, assess people with these issues. And I kind of, you know, tuck that away thinking, I want to be a complete GI doc. I want to be able to handle whatever comes through the door. If I've seen one patient uh, like this woman with the severe constipation, there'll probably be a couple more every year or so. Um, you know, and I, I should I should have some background in that. So that was my second mistake, uh, thinking that it would only be a couple patients a year. When I got into private practice up here in Portland, um, without even trying, it was five or six a week um, yeah. who, you know, I would do the diagnostic tests. I would do the endoscopies or the ultrasounds or the MRIs or the CAT scans or the blood tests and I wouldn't find anything. And so I would ask them the questions that Dr. Kaplan had taught me to ask, you know, 
most of them I, I was not thinking there was gonna I'm gonna get anything from that because these patients they don't look like they're upset they're not throwing things at the wall they're not you know breathing in like a panic attack they they look like anybody you'd see on the street or mm -hmm. uh, be working next to or be your neighbor uh, and then patient after patient is telling me these terrible burdens of stress that they're coping with it might be stress today it might be childhood stress like the first patient um, it could be uh, that they don't have good self-care skills they might have stressful personality traits that are reflecting them um, and patient after patient was having these issues i would send them off to mental health to get cured and they would get cognitive behavioral therapy and they would come back uh, and they would say it didn't help me now what and you know i i had not really learned how to treat people with this. I learned to diagnose it. I learned how to uncover the issues, but I always thought the mental health department would take over and, and do the curing just like Dr. Kaplan did. But we didn't have any Dr. Kaplans here in Portland and there was nobody. So I said, well, I will do the best I can. And I was a, a bumbling beginner for a couple of years, but even as a bumbling beginner, people were getting better. They were having better results than they were getting from the rest of the healthcare system. And they were very grateful. And so I kept going. You were giving and, them hope, even though you didn't have a quote unquote cure, you were saying, look, there might be something else going on here. So let's work on this. And, and let's then, talk about it. Yeah. yeah. And then what did yeah. you, you found Dr. Sarno and what was the next? The next <clears> no, I, um, I was seeing, you know, on the order of 250, 275 patients a year. And I was doing trial and error. Dr. Sarno was in New York. I was in Portland, which, you know, we're 2,400 miles apart. Um, he was doing back pain. I was doing gastroenterology. I didn't find out about his work until I wrote my first book in 2007. And I was on a national book tour. And I was in Chicago talking to an audience of about 50, 60 people in a, one of their uh, alternative bookstores there. And all of a sudden, the man in the back raises his hand and said, you sound like Dr. Sarno. And I said, who's that? Um, and he told me. And so I got mind-body prescription. I ordered it on Amazon that day, had it delivered to my house so it would be there when I got back home. And uh, I read through it and I thought, you know, this is great. I've got a kindred spirit here. I've got somebody that that understands that. And the first you know, book how... you wrote was, um, I'm interrupting, forgive me. Um, but your first book was. Um, they the, can't the, find anything, anything wrong. wrong with me. And you wrote no. that from your experience with your clients before so, before you understood TMS. You wrote that from your experience of talking and and of what you learned from Dr. Kaplan, that's, that's, that book came from there, not. That's right. right? Yeah. Wow. Seven, basically, you know, 7,000 patients plus over the 25 years or so cool. uh, before that book came out. <clears throat> and, you know, I would say after four or five years with 250 to 75 patients a year, I, I, my learning curve had reached a pretty good level. And, you know, the, the, my medical community responded to that. I mean, they were sending me patients who didn't even have gastrointestinal problems just because they didn't have a biomedical explanation for their illness, whatever it was. Yeah. And uh, they also, I got the doctor of the year award, which is usually given to much more senior doctors. Uh, and I, was given that award at age 37, which came as a big surprise uh, because I was having success with wow. patients that <clears throat> made no sense otherwise. Uh, wow. 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 So you contacted Dr. Sarno you. and then what happened? I love this timeline. Um, you know, I actually didn't um, meet Dr. Sarno until um, my friend Michael Galinsky's documentary film yeah. called All the Rage. You know, yeah. I know he's been a guest here uh, on your program. And we've yeah. been a guest together, I think. Uh, well, he he, he helped once, me. He uh, helped me and Rose start this. This, this wouldn't have happened oh, if, if, if I hadn't <laughs> like, I yeah, it's, it's, it's another whole story. Out to him, yeah. And I called so Michael. I was, and, yeah. Anyway, so that's how. Anyway, so I have just, a, a massive yeah. part of about a minute and a half in, in Michael's film. And um, he, so he invited me to. Um, How did I also, he find you? How did he find I also out you? 
um, you know, I, I, I had a, you know, I had a website, I had a book and he just, uh, yeah. was looking for expert commentators and, uh, he found me, I went to New York, he filmed me, uh, in his own home, uh, in New York city. And when the film premiered a few years later, um, I was invited to that and that was in 2016 and sitting two rows behind me was none other than John Sarno. So I introduced myself and, uh, he knew of my work. He was very complimentary, wow. and he actually referred me uh, a couple of patients uh, after that before he passed. Wow. Uh, so that that was a great honor. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So we have some listeners. If anybody out there wants to ask, ask any questions, please do in the feed. But I would love to ask a question. Rose, did you have something you wanted to respond to before I shift? No, no, you go ahead. It was all right. I yeah. Okay. My comment can go later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about the PBDA, which is just an amazing organization and it's full of amazing resources. And I, I feel like I lean on it to people who may have a little bit of like, what is this? And I just like feel it's an incredible organization. And that also came from your blood, sweat and tears. Um yeah, along with a lot of other people. Yeah, this PPDA stands for the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association. Uh, it's a name that just rolls off the tongue uh, so easily. Uh, <laughs> but we we spent, you know, my colleagues and I who founded it, there were, must have been eight of us. Uh, you know, we had uh, teleconferences for months trying to figure out which of the 15 synonyms out there we wanted to give to name our organization. But it goes back to, um, you know, two of my outstanding colleagues, uh, Howard Schubiner and John Strax, who are giants in this field. And they held a conference in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the spring of 2009, where they invited everybody they could find that uh, had uh, expertise in this field. And we all spoke for 20 or 30 minutes a piece. And uh, we were all saying the same things. We'd all independently uh, arrived at uh, highly similar conclusions, even though we were as different as we could be in our professional backgrounds. I mean, we had orthopedists and internists and um, sports medicine doctors and family doctors and uh, physical therapists and uh, mental health professionals. You just, you know, a whole range of people um, that had um, found their way to very similar ideas. We were, you know, answering each other's questions and finishing each other's sentences. Uh, it was a wonderful conference. And at the end of it, a group of us got together and said, we need to start a nonprofit uh, so that we can take these this information and get it out <clears throat> to um, the hundreds of thousands of physicians that um, are missing this diagnosis in their daily practice. And so it, we were founded, uh, let's see, it's almost 12 years ago now, 2011. Um, we've got uh, an online uh, a course uh, for professionals, but we took the jargon out of it so that patients can uh, can and do use it as well. Uh, we have a, a conference that's all recorded that people can uh uh, again, mostly jargon free. Uh, we've got um, two textbooks now, one called yeah, Psychophysiologic new, yeah. Disorders with 16 contributors from five different countries. And we have a new one called uh, a Diagnostic Guide, which ha is more for professionals. I have to say yeah. it's got a table of 500 diagnoses in it and describes what the diagnosis is in plain English and then uh, describes whether it's a PPD condition or not. Um, yeah. PPD is our, our, you know, synonym for TMS. Yeah. Uh, we like it because it blends psychology and physiology and emphasizes to medical professionals that this is, uh, should be considered part of their job description. Yeah. And I want to say in the, in the PBDA, um, there's a letter that you constructed for clients, for patients to give their doctor to say, can you in, uh, integrate with my people, you know, with my body, mind doctor, or am I saying it right? So you really cover, you understand how a patient would be questioning, like be wanting to, you know, bring their doctor in and the doctor might, you know, so that you, you just took care, you covered all that. Yeah, we wanted, uh, we know that um, medical professionals are trained that symptoms come from organ disease or structural damage. Uh, and that when they don't find organ disease or structural damage, uh, in 40% of their patients, it turns out, um, they usually tend to perseverate on that. They keep looking 
for a, a biomedical explanation. Um, one extreme example of that was presented to me after a talk I gave uh, here in Oregon, uh, where a family doctor had done 17 CAT scans of a young woman's uh, abdomen looking for a structural or organ cause of her abdominal pain. And all 17 of the CAT scans were normal. Uh, never thinking, you know, hey, there's a there's actually a third cause of symptoms, which is symptoms that are generated by the brain. And the brain does this because of stress. And you might want to assess your patient for stress. And what we teach in the PPDA is exactly how to do that, how to do a comprehensive stress evaluation so you don't miss anything. Tova, what I wanted to ask you is, could you put that on, on the sideline for everyone, PPDA? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so that um, it's recorded and uh, and then the psycho write the full um, explanation out so people... Watching, oh yeah, okay. Um, Psychophysiological, yeah. psychophysi. Psychophysiological. Yeah, Psycho. Yeah, yeah, the easiest thing Psycho to remember uh, because Physi. PPDA doesn't roll off the tongue is endchronicpain.org. Oh, excellent. <laughs> That's a lot Orders. easier. Orders. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look at uh, the question from yeah, Samantha please. Winslow okay. here. Can you, um, can you see it, uh, Dr. Clark? Can you see the question? I can, yes, yeah. about do how Dr. Sarno uh, treated his patients. Um, and I think, you know, one difference between Dr. Sarno and I is that he was much more insistent that patients um, embrace the idea of a psychophysiologic disorder, um, that they be fully committed to the fact that that was what they had so that they could shift their attention to sources of stress. And, you know, he, that may be because his patients um, had back pain and he got better results that way. You know, certainly if your patient is, is fully committed to um, a psychophysiologic explanation or a TMS explanation, then they can put their full energy into that and the results are probably going to be better. But so many of my patients, they, they weren't sure. Um, and I tried to embrace that as a practitioner. I would tell people, look, it's okay if you're not sure. Uh, you can continue working with your uh, medical clinician. Uh, to see if there's any organ disease or structural uh, explanation for what's going on, whether it's pain or a non-pain symptom. All I ask is that in parallel with that, and there's no contradiction to this, um, let's investigate um, your past and present life for sources of stress. And if we find some, let's work on those. Let's try to alleviate those sources of stress and see what kind of results we get. And if we find that your symptoms are improving in response to uh, alleviating sources of stress, that's going to be pretty persuasive circumstantial evidence that we're on the right track and that we should keep pursuing that rather than going after the biomedical. So I would let people start off with both ideas in their head. Uh, as long as we move forward um, with both of them, um, we would get uh, increasingly good information about um, what was truly going on. Yeah. Well, that's the same as the ISTDP model because really asking a patient to change that belief system when the, when the medical profession are the, are the absolute experts. So you're going to keep going back and looking at the patient's overall life and how their lives have been um, affected by stress allows them to sort of settle that, that searching, doesn't it? It allows them to, to drop it down so that you're spending time with their full lives rather than that particular area of their body, which, um, yeah. And if yep, you argue absolutely. against it, yeah, if you, are, if you argue against it, it also means that the patient is going to get their back up and say, well, you know, there's going to be a doctor that knows that it's a mechanical problem or whatever instead of um, a mind-body issue so yeah so that's i'm happy to meet, meet patients where they are and um yeah exactly go from there yeah, yeah. and well, it's that's, uh, that's how yeah. yeah it works i mean it, it absolutely works um you know people um um if uh, particularly if you present the idea of brain generated symptoms um, early on, you know, when somebody comes to me for the first time, and I may not know if they have an ulcer or a gallstone uh, or a stress related illness, but I want to 
mention all three possibilities and then we'll go do the diagnostic tests for ulcers and gallstones and I'll get them writing down a list of uh, all the stresses that they have past and present and then if the tests for uh, ulcers and gallstones are negative then they've got their list of stresses and we can look at that we've got something um, uh, more comprehensive uh, on the endchronicpain.org website it's a uh, 37 item questionnaire that can um, help people assess themselves for the likelihood that they have a stress related condition. So that's another resource there that um, people can use. And what you're doing is saying that, that um, if, even if you have something structural, is that right, Dr. David, what I put down there, nchronicpain.com? Uh, nchronicpain.org. .org. So um, what you're saying is that even if there is um, a structural problem, you're still saying to someone an emotional uh, wing of there will help you heal the physical. Yeah, and it's entirely possible that you can have both. I mean, it would be nice if you had stress-related illness that it would make you immune to any biomedical conditions, but obviously that's not the case and um, i've had patients uh, who had both a biomedical condition and a psychophysiologic condition and it was only when we addressed uh, both of those things that they uh, achieved the best outcome yeah 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 i mean if, you, if you've got a gallbladder problem you've got a gallbladder problem but it doesn't mean that you don't have stress does it yeah <clears throat> yeah so that's if you, right if you if you do the cholecystectomy, well, then at least that issue's gone and then you address the, the stress model and then they don't need to find another another stressor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There is a well-known entity called post-cholecystectomy syndrome. Cholecystectomy for people who are not professionals is removal, surgical removal of the gallbladder, uh, which is typically done when there's a gallstone sitting in there. But some people continue to have symptoms after the gallstone and the gallbladder are removed. And that's where that uh, diagnosis of post-cholecystectomy syndrome comes from. Uh, and that's usually a stress-related or psychophysiologic uh, phenomenon. It's like the phantom, the phantom leg, no? Yes, uh, that's a great analogy. Um, people who have had an amputation can feel pain at the site of the missing limb. And so it's clearly not being generated by the missing limb. It's instead being, which is no longer there. Uh, it's being generated by the brain. It shows the power of the brain to create real physical symptoms. Um, and what we are trying to do in the PPDA is get um, both public and healthcare professionals to recognize that um, this same phenomenon can go on in people who have never had an amputation. They can get pain anywhere in their body and lots of pains, non-pain symptoms, uh, purely generated by the brain. And there are now studies that show that the reason the brain is doing this is that the neuroanatomic circuits have been changed. The actual anatomy of uh, how the nerves are wired together is different than in people who don't have these conditions. And why is it different? It seems to correlate with how much stress the patient has been under um, either in the past or in the present day. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in, in our talking to people, we, uh, I think it was Bethany Raines told us, a neuroscientist, that the, the myelin on a stressed child is thicker than on um, a non-stressed child. And if you think about MS, for example, where the myelin's peeled off by the autoimmune system, could it be that the body itself is trying to heal itself by actually reducing the amount of myelin under stress? It's just so you know, fascinating. Yeah, I'm, there's no question that whatever is going on in psychophysiologic disorders, there is a uh, powerful physiologic component to it. You know, People mm -hmm. are not making these symptoms up. They're not imagining them. Uh, they are absolutely real phenomena. They are, yeah. And there's a physical reason for it. Like like when I thought about that myelin being thicker and, and how the body then wants to reduce the amount of myelin, I thought, you know, 
that's that's an actual physical problem that that the body's trying to to resolve yeah yeah, yeah. and there are yeah. a couple of studies now that show that if you do uh, one of the new pain relief psychotherapies which are far superior to cognitive behavioral therapy which unfortunately you know dominates the world of psychotherapy these days but the new pain relief psychotherapies uh, can actually change the neuroanatomy back to a healthy pattern the PRT. boulder ba boulder back pain study uh, using uh, pain uh, reprocessing therapy yeah, which yeah. is one of the new pain relief psychotherapies showed that the brain is physically changed uh, in response to psychotherapy and there was a study from 2003 of a patient single patient with severe irritable bowel syndrome and she had documented neuroanatomic changes in her brain that um, improved uh, with psychotherapy so Amazing. even the treatment has a physiologic basis. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Alan Abbas's website has got lots and lots of random uh, control RTCs showing how, how yeah, the talk therapy. Um, that can change the brain, can change the brain. the brain, yeah. It, and, it can... and we call it character change. Yeah. When you don't get offended anymore, when you, you don't get upset anymore, when you don't blame yourself anymore. It, it makes good sense, doesn't it, that, you know, that when you blame yourself, your, Absolutely. your body's going to... Yeah, I have to, you know, reassure a lot of my patients that people are not born perfectionists. They are not born hyper self-critical. Uh, they're not born as, as, you know, completely abject people pleasers. So, you know, people have to learn those personality characteristics, those stress inducing personality characteristics. And if we can look back at their childhood experience and understand how those uh, personality characteristics were acquired, uh, what kinds of uh, beliefs about yourself that are not true uh, were acquired because of that unhealthy or dysfunctional childhood environment. Then uh, when you can see how it was created, uh, it facilitates making changes. You know, if you it can does. see that yeah. growing up uh, that nothing you ever did was good enough, uh, that's how you produce a perfectionist. You're, you're putting your child on a treadmill they can never get off because they're mm -hmm. constantly trying to do the right thing, trying to do the best thing, and they're being put down for it. They're being made to feel like uh, it doesn't measure up or that they're a second rate human being, um, which in my patients only forces them to try uh, even harder yeah. and never to be oh, satisfied yeah. with even their best effort. Um, so these, um, um, that, that's something I always try to understand about my patients. What did you learn about yourself as a child uh, that isn't true Good because question. you grew up in an unhealthy environment? Yeah. Yeah. And then before I when I met when I met Rose, I learned about intergenerational trauma. So, you know, <laughs> and we're not here to blame parents or bash doctors. We're here to take responsibility. I mean, Rose and I are grandparents, so we understand family dynamics. But it's it's really not about blaming our parents. It's really about understanding them and 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 our parents taking um, responsibility. Yeah, but it's more most about parents, observing. Most how parents do their best. Yeah. yeah, yeah, most exactly. parents do yeah. their best. Um, you know, often in my patients, their best wasn't very good, um, but they have their own reasons why it wasn't very good. And as you say, it goes back through the generations. Um, whenever mm -hmm. I've been able to get uh, reliable information about previous generations, uh, it becomes very clear um, how it rippled down from grandparent to parent to patient. Yeah, yeah, so true. I would well, love to. Went, um, go ahead, Rose. No, I was going to say when I went to um, Montreal to see Dr. Davenlou, who was the original author, we we had the psychiatrists talking about intergenerational trauma and how it sets off the next the next cascade of problems. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of my patients were afraid to have children because they were afraid they would do a terrible mm -hmm. job. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I tried to assure them that uh, my, my definition of a good parent is somebody who did a, does a better job than their own parents did for them. You know, that as long as you can 
break that cycle as long yeah. as you can yeah. um, improve upon uh, the experience that you had as a kid, which uh, my patients are generally able to do, um, then you're uh, limiting the cascade of generational trauma to the next generation. Great. That's great mm -hmm. advice. <clears throat> great advice. Um, I would love to uh, leave um, some tools, like I like to say, um, TMS Roundtable, take home, take home tools, but we're not broken, so take home insights <laughs> or That's emotional cool. tools. I, I only heard about the word predictive coding from one of Dr. Schubiner's um, YouTubes. And I kept looking it up because I wanted to, to bring, bring it down to more of a, a layman's definition. I think it's a very powerful tool that people can learn and apply to their healing if they understand predictive, predictive coding. And could you give us a more of a layman's? Are you we able to do that, um, a layman's ex explanation for predictive coding because it's sort of a, a new concept not new but yeah yeah it is it is a new concept um and it essentially refers to the idea that your brain is kind of sitting there in a dark skull and it's uh receiving all kinds of information from the outside world and it's trying to make sense of everything that's coming in and it has to predict uh, make a prediction about what all that information means, um, especially if it if it means that there's a, uh, a tiger about to um, you know leap on you and, and tear you to shreds. Um, you know that yeah. you need to be able to uh, respond to that information in, in real time, uh, or you're not going to survive. Um, so it, it, the same thing happens with uh, signals from the body, um, and you may not. Um, you know, if you've grown up in an uh, unhealthy or dysfunctional environment, you may not um, accurately perceive uh, what's going on. Uh, the example that I like is um, if, um, let's say, you've gone over to um, a relative's home uh, for a meal, and all of a sudden you begin to feel um, a discomfort in your abdomen, and you know, what, what does that discomfort mean? Your brain is trying to figure out what that sensation is all about. Is it because you ate too much? Is it because you're hungry? Is it because you are angry at one of the people around the, the dinner table? Is it because you are madly in love with one of the people around the dinner table and they don't love you back? Um, you know, all kinds of different possibilities for what that discomfort uh, um, might mean. <clears throat> and if you've grown up in an unhealthy environment, um, you may um, not give an accurate definition to what's going on there. Um, a lot of my patients, for example, um, can have e enormous amounts of rage uh, at people for whom they also care. And they have spent their childhoods suppressing that anger. And so when they feel anger toward a person, legitimate anger toward that person, um, they're they're not able to put a name to it. They're not able to um, to say I'm having these bodily sensations because I am outraged at this person. They're having these bodily sensations because uh, they hurt um, or because they you know their bowels are, are in an uproar. Um, they're not recognizing that um, they're mad as hell. I mean the the very first story in that book uh, they can't find anything wrong is a patient who was having attacks of nausea, vomiting, and extreme dizziness, um, all in connection with interactions with her abusive mother. Um, but she had no idea of the, um, the tremendous emotional tension and, and emotions uh, that she was experiencing with respect to her mother because they were all going into her body um, yeah. instead of into words, instead of into conscious recognition. Um, and for 15 years, um, she was suffering these episodes of illness, uh, having no clue about where they were coming from. So, so much depends on the brain's ability to accurately interpret information coming from the world, coming from our bodies. Um, and when you grow up in an unhealthy environment, an environment you would never want for one of your own kids, for example, um, then 
you don't learn what those sensations mean. So the predictive mm. coding is uh, sort of a, it, does it, so it knows? It's necessary. The thing is, it's necessary. We need it. and But it's gone awry, hasn't it? We, we need, need it to it. be we accurate. Need you know, yes. we need, when, when um, you know, uh, if I have a relative at that dinner table and I want to drop kick that relative off the front porch, um, I need to, and, and that's why my, my stomach is tightening up because um, they're, they're saying things that are making me angry and I'm feeling that anger and I'm saying I'm angry at this person for what they're saying and uh, I'm going to respond to them by expressing my anger in words to them. Uh, that's entirely different than if my my stomach and my muscles are tightening up and I don't know why. Got it. Got it. One of, one of my thoughts as you were speaking, Dr. Clark, was about the ways, you know, we were talking about intergenerational trauma and early childhood trauma and how it affects pain. But one of the things you say, or I often hear you say, is about what you would do what would you do to, to the patient? What would you do if you saw a child in that circumstance? Would you share a little bit more about that so that people can apply it for themselves? Tova asked about tools before, but I see it as more just softening, softening your heart towards your younger self. Would you would you draw that up a little bit more. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that is my single favorite tool uh, for patients. Uh, and it <clears throat> involves even more than softening your heart, uh, as I'll explain in a second. Uh, but I ask people to imagine uh, that they are a butterfly on the wall of their childhood home. And they are watching a child whom they care about, either their own child or someone else's, uh, who is in that childhood home and is trying to cope with everything that the patient had to cope with, uh, even for just a week or 10 days. Uh, but the patient is a butterfly on the wall. They can't do anything. They can't intervene. They just have to watch. Wow. And a lot of my patients who will initially say to me, you know, I did go through some bad things when I was a kid, but I, you know, other people have been through worse and it really wasn't that bad. I, I've, you know, I, accepted it, I've tolerated it, I've moved on. Um, but when I ask them to do this butterfly on the wall exercise, their facial expression changes, they're, they're horrified by the mm -hmm. thought of what that would be like mm -hmm. to watch their own kid try to cope with all that same stuff. It, it makes them experience a much more accurate um, sense of what their childhood was truly like. And when they do that, uh, the next step is to respect themselves for how much they overcame, yeah. to have a recognition of the heroic perseverance that they must have had to have endured all of those experiences that they did. Uh, one of my patients who's most memorable in their reaction uh, to this exercise was actually a Hollywood actress uh, whose parents fought each other verbally and, and physically, mostly verbally, uh, for years. And she was the only child. She was a peacemaker. Uh, and, you know, up to the age of eight, she was always trying to, um, you know, settle her parents' uh, disputes uh, as best she could. Uh, and finally, at age eight, the parents divorced, uh, which, you know, you, you might think would uh, finally give her some relief. But unfortunately, the parents continued to live in the same household. They wow. slept in separate bedrooms, but they kept living in the same house. So from her perspective, it wasn't any better. And for the next 10 years, she continued to have to be a peacemaker. But she was, you know, telling me this story. Yeah, you know, it wasn't the best, but it wasn't that bad. Um, until I said, all right, you're the butterfly on the wall. You've got this beloved niece of yours, four, five, six-year-old niece whom you love to pieces. We're going to put that beloved niece in your household environment, and you're going to watch her try to cope with your parents for 10 days. What's that going to be like for you? And she just stared at me. Um, you know, ver very verbal person, as you might guess, uh, being an actress. I mean, she dominated the conversation, but she just was silent, just looking wow. at me. And finally, she said, at the end of a week, I would shoot myself. <gasps> yeah. 
Unbelievable. And she finally recognized just how bad it really was. Wow. And the next step from that is you have to, you know, s low self-esteem, you know, beating down of your self-esteem is such a common denominator in my patients who suffered childhood stress and, and a dysfunctional yeah. home. They're made to feel like they're not solving the problems in that home. They're made to feel like they're second rate human beings. Um, they acquire from that the perfectionism and the goodism and the um, extreme self-criticism and a whole long host of other stress-inducing personality traits uh, that oftentimes flow from that original foundational source mm. of low self-esteem. Wow. And if we can flip that around and say, look, you must have had heroic perseverance. You must have been extraordinary I to have dealt, dealt with that, that for so long. Survived that and yeah. begin the process of uh, pulling your self-esteem to the level that it deserves to be. And that has uh, tremendous benefits. You don't have to be a perfectionist if you believe in yourself. Um, you can fall short yeah. in your day-to-day -day life and say, you know what, uh, I'm okay with not being perfect because I did such a tremendous job even as a small child. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you, it changes your relationships. Um, you don't have to be somebody who's perpetually falling into relationships with people who need tremendous amounts of support and who have got all kinds of flaws. Um, if you believe in yourself, if your self-esteem is where it deserves to be, you're going to choose people uh, to be in relationships with um, who give you as much as you're giving them. 100%. And because yeah. you'll feel like you've earned it. You'll feel like you deserve it. Yeah. And that actress dumped her boyfriend the next day. He was one in a long string of assholes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and she was without a partner. You're vague, Dr. Clark. For, well, you know, I'm a GI doc. It's, it's the kind of expressions that I use. Um, but she was without a partner for over a year. And the next person she was in a relationship with, um, it was it was mutually supportive let's put it that way Amazing. and they, they've been happily married for over a decade wow what a story i'm going to answer yeah. a few of these questions because they're coming in for you um mm. can you see rivers question yes let's see here um perimenopause and menopause a lot of symptoms uh mind body take on this um yeah i mean everybody's different i mean the Menopause is, is uh, with the accompanying hormonal instability is well known to produce all kinds of uh, genuine, um, perfectly physiologic, mm -hmm. non-psychologic physical symptoms. But if they are not responding to uh, usual forms of treatment, if they're more severe than average, then it's important mm -hmm. to at least consider the possibility mm -hmm. that there's a psychophysiologic component going on there. And then we can do an assessment and find out, well, just exactly how many stresses are you coping with? The 37 item questionnaire on the endchronicpain.org website can help with that. Um, the, uh, the last of those questions is, how would you feel if you learned that a child you care about was growing up exactly as you did? Okay. Um, that's one of the, you know, probably the single most important of the 37 questions. Um, and the more stresses that you have, um, the more the chance that if we go to work on those, uh, we're going to see some improvement in your physical symptoms. So yeah, and <clears throat> you, can you say clearly that the the mind? Look, I experienced the my, my mind over overcame my hormones. I was able to not have symptoms because I was like, I'm not going to have symptoms. So I would like to hear. Do you believe that um, the mind is more powerful than the hormonal changes? In some people, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it varies a lot from person to person. Um, you know, the, there's no question that the hormonal changes uh, have real physical effects. And sometimes, because we don't have a blood test for this, sometimes yeah. the only way to find out how much uh, is a psychophysiologic uh, contribution is to do a stress assessment and begin to work on the stresses that we uncover and see how much improvement you get. Yeah. Rose, you're going yeah. to comment? Yes. Uh, patients with health anxiety find it more difficult to override the hormonal because the hormonal change is true and real. Yeah. But the anxiety about it is the problem. And exactly. even if you're needing 
to have hormone replacement therapy or anything else. It's about the anxiety that this has brought you. And any, any medical condition is always going to have a tie-in with some sort of anxiety, health anxiety, fear, fear of the future. So although these uh, issues, uh, symptoms are there, the anxiety that it brings with it is, is, um, is severe. Exactly. And it's a vicious so, cycle. You know, you have the anxiety yeah. that contributes to the symptoms, which contributes to more anxiety. Yeah. That's Sorry. right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So when um, you see yourself as a person who goes to health anxiety, goes to that future that this is going to be bad, recognize that and see then how your anxiety is exacerbating your symptoms. So good advice, yeah. excellent advice. I mean, yeah, it's a, in, in uh, a prime component of pain reprocessing therapy uh, that you shift your attention from the part of your body that is having symptoms um, uh, to your brain to recognize yeah. that the brain is what is doing this and to shift away from the anxiety and fear uh, that are connected to the uh, location of the symptoms and begin thinking about, well, what's going on in the brain that uh, is contributing to this. Beautiful insights. Um, no, uh, uh, Patty, Dr. Clark lives in Oregon, not Tampa. To do your question. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, and then, and then Mark uh, Schwartz, this is his question. Can you see it, Dr. Clark? Yeah. Yeah. The difference. Uh, well, um, yeah, Dr. Sarno was, um, you know, a pioneer in this field, and um, he achieved a lot doing a, essentially a version of pain reprocessing therapy, getting people to shift their attention from their back pain to what might be going on psychologically. And just having people shift their attention uh, enabled uh, a lot of them uh, to solve their own problems. Um, you know, they could begin to think about if this is stress related. Uh, you know, we just saw an article in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, uh, today that was posted uh, about the uh, talk show host in the United States, who's very well known, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, experiencing uh, relief of his back pain from reading one of Dr. Sarno's books. And he also, yeah, he heard Howard Stern talking on a show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, Howard Stern is a radio talk show host, very well known in the U.S., who uh, uh, also got relief of his uh, physical symptoms uh, from the Sarno approach. But uh, many people, um, the uh, psychological issues are uh, too difficult for them to solve on their own merely by shifting their attention, uh, and they need to go deeper. And there's a, an app called Curable out there that uh, goes deeper, that it's um, they have um, borrowed the best ideas from me and, you know, most of my, my colleagues around the country and some international and put them into a wonderful user interface. And it uh, the benefit of it lies somewhere between a good book and a good psychotherapy. Curable is amazing, but I have to say there's someone named Rose Hoy that helps you go deeper. <laughs> yes. Rose and then Hoy. Finally, if ISTDP. The, uh, if the app doesn't do it, then, is, then a, is a gold a, standard as far a, as I'm a therapist, concerned. A therapist that knows one of the pain relief psychotherapies, uh, whether it's pain reprocessing, which is, is the simplest in many ways, yeah. and then emotional awareness and expression therapy is, for me, kind of the next level beyond that because you're digging straight into the emotions. And then if that's not enough, ISTDP uh, kind of, to me, is the most sophisticated, um, but also... Um, um, not it's as available, let's put place. it that way. Yeah. It's very yeah. effective, um, but there are only a, a handful of practitioners that are um, truly expert in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I well, won't... anyone who wants it, I can. We've got a, yes. a website that I can. Refer and Rose to does ISTDP and I do PRT, so we got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will. I'd like to um, answer these few questions because I, I know we haven't seen. We, a lot of visitors come special to see you, Dr. Clark. So I'm always happy to see people in the live show. And everyone knows that after the live show, uh, I think you're number 150. I think today we're number 150 broadcast. Wow. Rose and I are going on three years in March. We're <clears throat> meeting in April. We have not met. And Rose is coming to Israel in April. 
Oh, no kidding. And we're meeting for the first time in person. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, okay, enough about us. So listen, um, Patty Clark says, can we have an example with someone with pain? Yeah, um, you know, the the nature of the symptoms and people are always very interested in is there anybody out there like me? Have these techniques worked for someone who has my specific symptoms? And my answer to that is that if you have been evaluated by a physician, if you've had a diagnostic uh, assessment and there is no structural damage or organ disease that explains your symptoms, then the, by far the most likely explanation is a psychophysiologic disorder. Another way to look at this is that 40% of people who go to a general practitioner with a symptom, um, have a psychophysiologic disorder is what they have. Um, if the diagnostic tests are negative, then the probability of it being a PPD goes from 40% to probably 90%. Wow. If, the, if the person has a lot of stress, then the probability goes even higher. If you treat the stresses and the symptoms begin to improve, the probability goes even higher. So whether it's pain or tinnitus or uh, irritable bowel or constipation or vomiting or coughing or ringing in the ears, um, you know, all of those symptoms, if they aren't attributable to a biomedical explanation, then we definitely should pursue the PPD approach because it's um, the most likely to be successful. So the symptoms don't matter. That's right. what I, the symptoms don't matter. It's the person behind the symptoms. You're a strong and sensitive person who has TMS and PBDA. <laughs> you can, you've, you created this, your body created this, your body can get rid of it. And so I, I know it's people don't want to hear that. I say, it's not about your symptoms because I know, <laughs> I know Ray, I know, I love you, Ray. I'm so happy to see you. And I know you're struggling with tinnitus and I know you've gotten rid of it and it's come and gone. And I know you want to know Dr. Clark's opinion about tinnitus. So go ahead, Dr. Clark. Yeah, no, it, um, if there's no biomedical explanation found, then there's a good chance that a psychophysiologic approach uh, will help. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's always possible that a person has a biomedical explanation that our diagnostic tests are not able to find um, and we always have to acknowledge that just in the you know in the course of my 40-year career of doing this uh, there have been a lot of infectious agents for example that have been discovered that we didn't know about when i was uh, first starting out uh, hepatitis c for example or uh, the zika virus uh, or hiv for that matter i mean we didn't know about those things when i was in medical school uh, that's how far back i go so we always have to um, keep an open mind as physicians that we don't know everything and not every patient is the same um, but uh, this condition is 50 percent more ppd is 50 percent more common than diabetes so there are you know millions of people something like one in six mm -hmm. adults that suffer from this so it absolutely needs to be assessed and treated um, in anybody that um, doesn't have a uh, biomedical explanation and i would like to say on the record rose and i have have met people and continue to meet people that even with permanent quote unquote permanent conditions you can still use these methods and insights to um change your relationship with your condition, have a healthier relationship, the, the, the sen sensations will be quieter, they'll go down, they'll come and go less. The quality and quantity of your condition will change. I don't- The quality I don't of think, your life will change, yes. even with the somatic pain. Even the with permanent of your things. life will change. Right, now you may disagree with me, Dr. Clark, but if someone has a permanent tinnitus condition, I imagine if they focus on some other music, they won't focus on the tinnitus. Do you you know that that insight? Um, yeah, I'm I'm not an expert uh, on tinnitus, um, but um, you know I I think that if again there's not a explanation that your ear specialist or your neurologist can find um, that this approach should be investigated. You know, it's not a guarantee that it's going to work, but um, 
the psychophysiologic uh, disorders are so common and they can cause uh, symptoms anywhere in the body of any level of severity. Somebody asked me about pain. One of my patients was a 17-year-old girl who was getting 250 milligrams of morphine a day uh, around the clock by a um, patient-controlled anesthesia pump. Uh, if you're not familiar with morphine doses, 5 or 10 milligrams is enough to alleviate the pain of a fractured leg, and she was getting 10 milligrams every hour. And she'd been in the hospital 10 weeks already by the time I was asked to see her. Um, you know, that's as, as severe as you're ever going to see in terms of pain. And yet, by uncovering the stress that was responsible for her otherwise unexplained abdominal pain, um, she was off of all opioids in 30 days. Uh, mm -hmm. So th this approach is uh, always going to be worth exploring um, anytime the biomedical has been excluded. Could I add that tinnitus is probably cognitive perceptual disruption. So it's another form of anxiety. So if, if uh, because the, the, there's levels of anxiety in the body and the effect in the body. And uh, I would imagine that um, cognitive perceptual disruption is what's happening to a person with tinnitus. So just to, sometimes yeah. you can't, you can't actually name the anxiety or the stress, yeah. but it's there and it's in the body and it's operating in the body. So just, yeah. just for, who was it that said Ray, about that? Ray, Ray. Ray, yeah, yeah. So if you um, see it from that angle, it might wait. then drop down for you. Yeah. Yes, I sure am it's anxious hard. about something. Hmm? All right, sure so hard, we see a, Lena Nielsen is asking how to get the point across uh, to um, uh, her doctor and the uh, endchronicpain.org website, um, mm -hmm. as Tova mentioned earlier, has a letter that yeah. you can um, give uh, to your medical clinician. Uh, there are also, um, there's a bibliography there of over Great 200 scientific references. Each one yeah. of them has a paragraph explaining the significance of that research, yeah. um, which uh, supports uh, the approach that we're taking here that we're talking about including in recent years um, several randomized controlled trials which is the the gold standard in science which shows that um, these new pain relief psychotherapies that we've been talking about are uh, far superior to what we've had in the past uh, far mm -hmm. superior to cognitive behavioral therapy far superior to other mm -hmm. forms of placebo mm -hmm. um, and the pain scores just drop uh, precipitously uh, when these are used. And Amazing. Um, it's when you show physicians these outcomes and if they're willing to be open minded and learn about these things. And we've got an online course that's specifically designed for excellent. Physicians, I took it. It's patients excellent. Patients can use it, too. Mm -hmm. um, and one doctor who, who took the course took me aside at a conference and she'd been using these ideas for a year or so. And she said it had put the joy back into her practice yeah, that's a beautiful. because now all of a sudden patients that used to make her beat her head against the wall, um, she was able to achieve successful outcomes beautiful. for them. And Lena, Lena healed herself from ankylosing spondylitis. We had her on our show, which is a, an autoimmune. It was the same thing that Norman Cousins had. Yes, yes. In, inflammation of the uh, vertebral bones of the yeah. spine. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, not everybody can achieve that kind of outcome. But um, childhood stress, we believe, also can uh, activate the inflammatory system. And um, mm -hmm. there is hope, no data yet, yeah. but hope that if we can um, successfully address the long-term impact of childhood yeah. stress, that we may be able to reduce the impact on the inflammatory system long term. Wow. But I'll emphasize we have zero data on that so far, but yeah. um, it wouldn't be a shock uh, if that was the case. Yeah. Um, I'd well, like I've to got, add- I've got patients that, are, yeah. um, that have got uh, um, arthritis and uh, their symptoms just go down with ISTDP. I don't know. I talked Absolutely. to Dr. Um, Abbas about, uh, uh, it, specifically about an MS patient that I had once. And I said to him, would the, would the patient recover? And he said, I don't know. Research hasn't happened there yet, but the patient's symptoms will go down. 
Yeah. So yeah. I've met we, we've had I've met four or five people with MS who completely are living a high functioning life, exercising, and not having any symptoms at all. Yeah. Yeah. But I, what I was asking Doctor Abbas was, would the myelin go back on the on the nerves? And he said, "Well, there's That's no research different. done on that." Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the we patient, don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, MS is hard because um, it is characterized by uh, fluctuations in severity so that when somebody yeah. improves, it, you know, it's hard to know if that was the natural progression of their illness or if it was in response to, uh, to treatment. Yeah. Um, but there is solid evidence that if you were subjected to stress as a child, that your chances of getting an autoimmune disease in, as an adult are significantly higher. Uh, and it's yeah. also, you know, the chances of getting heart disease and peptic ulcer and cancer are higher. And, you know, what is the mechanism of that? Why should childhood stress impact more than just psychophysiologic disorders, but also impact um, organ diseases like that? And the, the presumption is that the inflammatory system is being activated by this uh, wow. psychological trauma in children. Um, and so that gives me some hope that if we can alleviate the impact, um, the per stressful personality traits, the unrecognized suppressed emotions, the uh, impact of triggers that are linked to past trauma, um, that we may be able to have an impact on a person's um, uh, biomedical health down, down the road. Yeah. But amen, as, amen, amen. as Dr. Abbas yeah. said, we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, can you comment on, um, uh, wait, Patty, Patty said something about... Um, Epstein Barr. I mean, I imagine it's the same symptom, same explanation. Epstein Barr, or um, uh, what's the tick? The tick disease. Yeah, uh, the Lyme disease. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there are a, a number of clinicians out there went, that, when confronted with uh, psychophysiologic symptoms, they are looking for a, a biomedical explanation, and they are pointing the finger at uh, chronic viral infections. Um, but there, there really isn't any evidence uh, that um, this is the case. Um, yeah. And um, what yeah. we're finding is that a lot of patients who were diagnosed with these conditions um, actually have a psychophysiologic disorder and um, they respond uh, far better to uh, mind-body uh, therapeutic yeah. approaches yeah. than they do to um, these, you know, frankly, crazy attempts to uh, eliminate the viruses or the spirochetes. Right. Um, I would like to see if there's any other new questions. Um, before that, Rose's got you, a good comment. Rose, can you just quickly um, repeat to Ray um, what the cognitive, that tinnitus is a cognitive, so explain, explain, explain the word. Okay, explain we've it. got striated muscle activation, which is a sort of an anger response. We've got smooth muscle activation, which is what Dr. Clark is a specialist in. But then we also have cognitive perceptual disruption, another level of anxiety where the, um, the, the, the ears, you know, the tinnitus happens. And, and that is another, it's just another form of anxiety. And it's, mm -hmm. again, related to stressors and it's related to early stress. So, yeah. And as Dr. Clark was saying, Early stress has a different, um, the level of early stress will cause a different level of anxiety, a different form of anxiety. And, and right. often, you know, you read Dr. Sano's book or Dr. Clark's book and get better. But then another stress will come up, uh, uh, you know, like death, a divorce, you know, something like that. The stress will come back because the pattern has been set. So... Right. That's just another right. another form of anxiety. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's um, just a different way of looking at what – it's another way of looking at what Dr. Yeah. Clark is talking about. And, just, and it and just what, means that it's an earlier right. stress. And, right. you know, if you think about it, I, I'd like to join in with Lena's comment about epigenetics. If your mother is having cortisol flowing through her – her her system it's going to go into the baby so the baby's going to be born with cortisol running around her or his system so that epigenetics is already set set in place and it's the same with those forms of anxiety 
earlier on, the anxiety is going to be a little bit different. That's all. Yeah. But yeah, ep some... epigenetics can be thought of as switches on your DNA that are either turned yeah. on or not, and the um, it's possible to have those. Uh, transmitted down through the generations so that yeah. uh, someone who has experienced a lot of stress um, in a grandparent, for example, it can be transmitted down uh, to the uh, grandchild. Um, and even though the, uh, the mother didn't necessarily experience the same stress that the grandmother did. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, there's a lot of research done on Holocaust survivors at, at the moment and allowing that stress that's coming down in second and third generations and they're living exactly. in peace. Yeah. But they're still being stressed. Yeah. I'm I'm just gonna put something in my battery. I have to put my plug in, but I wanted to mention, you know, do you know, Dr. Clark, I'm sure you know about this, um that the the egg of my grandmother, the Eggs yes. of our grand. Tell me, Rose, you're a midwife. What is the eggs of our grandmothers are in the granddaughters? That's got yeah. to be body mind. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about the the eggs, but definitely the uh, epigenetic switches on the DNA. I mean, there was a study that showed that um, grandparents who had been subjected to higher levels of stress. Um, their grandchildren had uh, were had more responsive um, bodies in reaction to um, stresses than the grandchildren of um, grandparents who didn't go through a lot of stress, even if the mothers were in similar um, socioeconomic uh, categories. Um, so yeah. it it was able to be transmitted. Um, the, you know this higher level of stress responsiveness could be transmitted down um, through the generations in the form of these uh, switches on DNA that uh, either turns on something or doesn't turn on something. Um, it, it has a lot to do well, with it, how your DNA functions. Yeah, well, the DNA in the ova, that ova is already in in the female child. And that of the grand, the grandmother, the grandmother's, how is that? The grandmother's over, plural, in her body are subjected to a, a wash of cortisol, for example. A wash of cortisol because of stress. The next child is born, the next female, that imprint is already, that cortisol imprint, the, the, the biomarkers are already switched on. And then it comes to fruition in the next generation when there's early childhood trauma. Would that make sense to you, Lena? That the, it can skip a, a generation because the the um, we used to have this um, what's it um, discussion years ago about whether it's um, uh, oh it's gone from me the. Um, whether it's where we're living, who we're living with, or if it's in our genes. What's that called? Um, nature, nature or nurture. nurture. Nurture, yes, yes. So if you think about the nurturing being not quite right, the nurturing in the second generation, okay, calm and everything, but the third generation, for example, the nurturing is difficult, well, then the, the, the gene is already switched on, so and depend. the person's going to get cancer or, right. or whatever. It'll depend. Yeah. 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 So Lena wants to know, Dr. Clark, have you, do you work with children? And how would you, what would be your suggestion if you were had children coming to your practice? Of course, and by the way, there is a book that Dr. Schechter um, writes. Is he, he, he makes a workbook, a wonderful workbook for teens uh, and journaling for teens. Um, that's available for children. And he, by the way, is the author of the second book. He's one of the authors of the second book with you, I think. Anyway. Plug yeah, in. that's right. Yeah, he uh, was a contributor to yeah. um, both of the recent yeah. uh, textbooks. Um, mm -hmm. I, the youngest age group that I was treating myself was uh, adolescent. Um, I only had a handful of patients who were younger than that. And usually those were 
uh, children who had specific uh, life stresses in the present day rather than having uh, experienced childhood trauma. Um, the, um, a lot of the adolescents that I treated, um, actually the stress, the prime stress was outside of the family, but it had an impact on the family that uh, people tried to cope with as best they could. And the result of that um, was um, a lot of pressure or stress being placed on the patient. Um, you know, one example, very simple, was um, uh, the father was killed in a motor vehicle accident. And this put, uh, you know, he was the breadwinner and it put a lot of economic pressure on the family. And the, the um, widow and her daughter, the daughter was about 11 years old, uh, basically both had to um, change their lives uh, in order to uh, make the two of them economically viable so they wouldn't lose their house, for example. Um, and all of a sudden that, that daughter was, you know, pitched right in to try to um, help the, uh, the family unit consisting of the widow and, and the, the patient. Um, and they both worked, you know, extremely hard to, you know, keep their house and keep enough money coming in. Um, but as a result, the uh, patient didn't really get an opportunity to continue being a child. Sure. I mean, she had to be sort of a, instantly at age 11, become a junior adult. And after a couple of years, um, you know, she was missing out on opportunities to uh, attend to her own, you know, needs for rest and relaxation, relaxation and recreation. And her body was uh, uh, protesting in response to that. But, you know, it, it wasn't anything that anybody did wrong. I mean, everybody was doing their best. It was just in, in response to a, a very difficult um, stress that was placed on both of them. So you wouldn't um, treat it in many different. You would still treat with the same insights that you treat an adult. You'd ask a little girl, I mean, tell, tell maybe Lena wants to know maybe how, what, you, what recommendations would you have given regarding mind body? How would you treat um, a young child with, with uh, tools, insights? Um, you know, could I, could I, small children I? are, are different. Um, they're not just little adults and, uh, you really need to have experience to give a good answer to that question. But, you know, an adolescent, I? I can definitely intervene. And yeah. I, with that last patient, it was as simple as carving out a half day a week where she could just be a, be a teenager sense, and yeah. that yeah. solved the problem. Yeah. Rose, what would you do? Yes. Well, what I do when I am asked to see a child or a teenager, I'll see them for a couple of little visits, and then I suggest that a parent spend time with me. So, but I have to break in because it's usually the problem is put on the child. The child's got stomach pain, and you know, the doctor can't find anything wrong. You know, the child is doing this and that and the other. And I speak to the child, maybe a session or two. And then I say to, to mum or dad, would you mind, you know, maybe you could help your son or daughter by spending some time doing some talk therapy with me. And then you could then take over the care of your child. So you treat and the that, family. That you treat the family. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You have to understand yeah. all the dynamics that are going on in the family because the patient is still living in the midst of that family. And exactly. The, and they the can't child's, change. The child's physical symptom is typically the top of an iceberg. Yes. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But the, the way of getting in there is to to move in with where the parents want you to move and then moving back out. So, I mean, there's probably better people are doing this than me, but that's, that's my way of doing it. So I can help the child by helping the whole family. Yeah. A lot of, you know, again, my adolescents, um, it wasn't that they were, had been abused or, or mistreated or uh, it was more, that there was a big stress impacting the family and everybody was doing their best as they saw it. And it was having an adverse effect on, on the adolescent, uh, even though everybody was doing as well as they could. Exactly. Well, you gave the example of the widow and the child then becoming parentified, helping mum 
you know, survive. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that's so important. And just allowing that child to be a child and to give time to the child. Yeah. 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 My Dr. my Clark patient is, who was sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's just wonderful that you come on and we go through the whole gamut. Okay, you're looking at gastroenterology. But we're also, we've looked at tinnitus, we've looked at back pain, we've looked at all those things, and we can gather it all together and then see that the, the, the what do you call it, the, um, the common denominator is stress. That's right. Yeah, Anxiety. no, I, you know, I, it wasn't long after I learned how to do this work successfully that people were sending me sim patients with symptoms from head to toe. I, I always remember one gentleman, he had total body itching of his skin mm -hmm. and I you know I looked at the the chart before I went into the exam room and I went total body itching this is what you're sending me as a gastroenterologist somebody whose whole body is itching and he's already been to three dermatologists and three neurologists and you want me to do something with this are you kidding me <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I go in the room and he's you know he's a man in his 70s and he's sitting on the front edge of the chair um, <clears throat> leaned over. He looks like he's in the middle of a rugby scrum um, and like he's going to bolt out of the room uh, as quickly as possible. And I, I just, you know, uh, mentally was smacking my forehead going, this is going to be a complete waste of time. But, you know, 30 minutes later, we knew what was wrong ah. and um, alleviated 95% of his symptoms within three weeks. No and just way. just no. using the same ideas we're talking about here. Find the stress. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I, you know, I have to say on the record, because I know Ray and I know that she would be happy, she'd be okay if I talked about this. I mean, you know, her father died in a in a in a dental office when he, he got his tooth pulled and he got a heart attack and died. Oh. And oh. Ray's, Ray's tonight is started when she got a tooth pulled. So it's clear, sweetheart, it's clear, honey, that yeah. we, you know, we have, we have this solution, but it's hard to implement what we're saying. Like we're talking about, like, it's easy. Like this guy healed in three weeks. He was able to implement it, you know, Ray. And I know, you know, other people here, and I know myself having difficulty sometimes implementing the insights into the time when we're having the issue, when we're in the stress. And so maybe you can just address that for some of the people that, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I'd right love away. to talk about the patients who were, you know, rapidly cured, but yeah, other people need years of psychotherapy to achieve the oh, same yeah. outcome. So it's, it, everybody's different. It's um, how severe was the, the stress or trauma that you were subjected to? How young an age were you subjected to it? Um, yeah. How much, you know, resilience uh, were you born with? Uh, did you have somebody in your life as, as a young person who believed in you, who gave you support, who made you feel valued? Um, you know, that can go a long way toward countering uh, adversity that you might have grown up with. There are so many variables here. Um, you know, if, it, if you're not able to heal yourself in, in you know, 63 minutes, um, that doesn't say anything about you. It, it says a lot more about um, the magnitude of what you're coping with. Uh, yes. You know, my patients are, are my heroes for a reason. I mean, they are they are world champions at carrying stress around, but because they don't know how much stress they're carrying, they can't see that they're uh, the equivalent of uh, Olympic weightlifters. So, what's your suggestion for people that are really chronic and really not really you know get falling and getting up and falling and getting up, but not staying up? What's your suggestion? Well, I would have uh, faith and hope that uh, you're going to continue to make progress. Uh, two steps forward, one step back is, is normal for this. And a lot of my patients, they are healing themselves. They are changing those neuroanatomic circuits every day. But it's in the nature of uh, neural networks that um, you can heal 85% of those nerve circuits and not notice any difference in how you feel. Um, and sometimes when you get to that last five or 10% uh, of healing, uh, it unleashes a whole tornado of yes. uh, difficulty. Like you're almost there. And... You're almost there. And then you finally you're ready yes. to deal with the really bad stuff. Yeah.
uh, which commonly is, you know, one of the big ones is rage against somebody whom you care about. Um, and the uh, that tornado can make you feel like you've just, you know, wasted the last five years of hard work, but it actually is a sign that you're almost there. Yes. Uh, and that, yes. You, that you've just saved the most difficult stuff for last. Um, yes. So, um, again, I would have faith if that keep doing this work, and even if it doesn't seem like it, things are changing inside. Exactly. And how I get people to calibrate it is I ask them about the relationships with their loved ones. And they can usually give me an idea of what's changed. And they'll often say to me, oh, well, so-and-so is so different now, but they don't realise that it's they that are different. <laughs> and so-and-so has responded to that. Now, Dr. Clark, Thank you so much for your time again. Well, one one it's last point that I have to make then is for is for people to look back if they're wondering about why they're not making any progress. Have them look back a year, three years, five years, and see where they were. Um, and oftentimes, yes. when you look back, you say, "Well, you know what? I was a lot worse back then." And then you can see that you actually are making Beautiful. progress. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Because Wonderful. that health anxiety keeps us in that loop. So. But the relationships have changed. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. attitude has changed. But the health anxiety loop can often be like that little wheel on the yeah. um, Well, I, I think I think we're going to Rose and I are going to have a board meeting and talk about Dr. Clark being a regular. Maybe once a month. <laughs> we'll talk to your wife about it and your board of directors. Uh, no. <laughs> we love we love having you. Really, the conversations are just so thank rich you. and so wonderful. So listen, thank you so much. Rose, have a wonderful day. Dr. Clark, have a wonderful well, afternoon. Tyler. I'm going to bed. Oh, <laughs> and we'll be back yes, next definitely. week with the help of God and the internet. <laughs> okay, okay, have a wonderful Bye-bye, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. it's, it's always a joy, and I appreciate the, all the work you're, you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We'll see the stars. Wait a second. One second. Bye, Dr. Clark. Thank you so much.